Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this IIE webinar this afternoon. My name is Mary C. Murphy, and I'm a senior lecturer in politics at University College Cork. On behalf of the Irish Institute for International and European Affairs, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. This webinar forms part of the IIEA's Global Europe Project, which is supported by Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. And for that reason, it's open to the public and free to attend. And we're delighted to be joined today by Christine Schreiner Bergener, who is the United Nations Special Envoy on Myanmar. And the Special Envoy has been very generous in taking time out of her very busy schedule to speak to us today. The Special Envoy will speak for about 20 minutes or so, then that will be followed by a short moderated discussion before we go to a Q&A session with our audience. Now you can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to send those questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once the special envoy has finished her presentation. A reminder too that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming this morning's discussion or this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in via YouTube. Well, today's webinar focuses on the current turmoil in Myanmar. The coup earlier this year has reversed the progress of the democratization process there. And as we speak, conflict on the ground is escalating. The economic situation is deteriorating and the near collapse of the medical system has completely undermined any ability to effectively confront the COVID-19 public health emergency. Today, Myanmar is facing the very real prospect of a looming and large scale humanitarian and human rights disaster. So today is a very valuable opportunity for us to hear from UN Special Envoy Schreiner Bergner about the situation in Myanmar and how Ireland and the international community might help to avert political, economic, public health and humanitarian crises. Ms. Christine Schreiner Bergner was appointed Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General on Myanmar in April 2018. She has over 25 years of experience in diplomacy, having served in various high level government positions in the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Ms. Bergner was the ambassador of Switzerland to the Federal Republic of Germany from 2015 to 2018. And before that, from 2009 to 2015, she served as ambassador to the Kingdom of Thailand and led efforts to mediate between the two sides in the violence that erupted in Thailand in 2010. The special envoy also has a connection to Ireland. She served as deputy ambassador to Ireland from 1997 to 2002. So it's a great pleasure to invite the Special Envoy, Christine Schreiner Bergner, to address today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be in Ireland virtually again. And uh, I hope to, uh, to get in only tw around 20 minutes uh, to the audience. Uh, about the complexity and the, the challenges of uh, Myanmar. And um, I would like to show you some slides. Um, and most of the pictures I took myself in Myanmar. Um, so I started in uh, 2018. Uh, it was based uh, on, um, maybe before, yeah, uh, it was based on the GA resolution in 2017 and the Secretary General Antonio Guterres appointed me as the Special Envoy on Myanmar. Um, clearly, um, it's a, a very challenging uh, mandate because uh, it um, has a, a whole range of issues which uh, the mandate has as the TORs. Uh, it includes the peace process all over all the country. Uh, it includes Rakhine to make the conditions conducive to bring the refugees back from Bangladesh, the democratization uh, in all over all the country, good governments, human rights promotion, 
uh, human rights protection, um, helping or supporting combating corruption, uh, accountability, uh, but also the election 2020 uh, was part of my mandate. Uh, next. Myanmar is clearly uh, geopolitically very important and many countries like China, India, but also Thailand are very much worried about the ongoing conflict in Myanmar. And that's the reason I had also to travel a lot to meet those governments who are interested in. Uh, it's the country faces clearly a lot of uh, difficulties uh, based uh, also on the history. They were only 1948, uh, they had independence, but 1962, the military coup, which led the country to uh, more than 70 years of isolation, which is still uh, um, the, the root causes of um, the, the many other problems like uh, poverty in the country, uh, but also the lack of a real uh, democratization uh, in the country. Next. This isolation clearly led uh, also to uh, a lot of poverty of the people. 25% uh, of the, the population lives under the poverty line. Now with the, the military coup and the ongoing conflict, the UN counts that we will have next year, 50% of the population lives under the poverty line. When I started on my Monday, uh, there were only um, around 40% of the people were connected to electricity. So the country was, is uh, quite very poor and not well connected. So from to travel from one point to another uh, is very difficult. And this is now more difficult uh, than ever uh, with the ongoing conflict. Um, next. Um, Myanmar is also very diverse. We have uh, 14 uh, states uh, with 135 uh, ethnic minorities, uh, several diff different languages, um, and um, clearly they were never really united. There was always a civil war between the ethnic armed organization and the army. At the beginning of my mandate, I had clearly to make for myself a strategy. How can I fulfill this mandate with so many issues to deal with? So uh, I decided to uh, learn the country, to travel, to meet the people, uh, to uh, listen and to be a bridge uh, between uh, the NLD government uh, and the, the military, we call them Tamado, between uh, the different states with the different ministries and the, uh, the government in Napido to be a bridge between Myanmar and uh, the international uh, community because uh, they didn't really like to, to work with the UN. Uh, but also uh, in the ASEAN that we uh, have, I'm the bridge also to uh, towards uh, the ASEAN countries. Uh, next. The strategy was also uh, what I forgot to say is uh, to keep quiet in the public because I wanted to gain trust and uh, wanted to have um, a connection where I can start to give recommendations. So this was also uh, on the peace process overall. I think many people only concentrate on the Rakhine and Rohingya issue, but uh, normally we forget that the country had always uh, a peace process problem with uh, around 21 ethnic armed organizations. You see here on the map, uh, the, all the 21 organizations, mostly at the border uh, on the east coast, uh, east border, and um, they have sometimes uh, 30,000 soldiers, so they are also quite heavily equipped with weapons. Um, and they fight it in the past against the, the military. And in the last five years uh, since the NLD government is, was in place, 
uh, not really um, things moved in a, in a satisfactory way. Next. Clearly, uh, under those conditions, many civilian people suffered, and especially children. You can see here uh, child soldiers. Um, and um, in, fortunately, in the last uh, three, four years, when I started my mandate, we could quite uh, solve this problem. But now we are almost back to square one. We heard already that they restarted to recruit children uh, to um, have them as uh, soldiers. But clearly also all uh, civilian people suffered under uh, the, uh, the um, conflict and the isolation. And it created um, 336,000 IDPs in all over the country. Next. So when I started to travel, I went also like in the region of Kachin, where I talked to, to women, they were all victims of the conflict. Um, and I wanted to hear from them what they can expect, what they want to uh, expect from the UN, what can I do? We have around 2,500 staff members in Myanmar from the UN, that's the UN uh, country team. Uh, they are working on the humanitarian assistance. Uh, they had to care for around 1 million people before the coup, now we have around 3 million people, which the, the same team has to deal with. But clearly my mandate was separately to the UN uh, country team. So my team was in the beginning only two staff member and I had to be home based. That means uh, I live in Switzerland, but I traveled back and forth to Myanmar and then to New York, but I also visited uh, the P5 um, members, so I went to Moscow, Washington, Paris, London, um, Beijing, uh, but I also visited um, India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, and almost all ASEAN member countries. Next. Here I also spoke to um, the local governments here in Kachin, but also in, in other uh, states uh, to listen to them because it was really a, not the uni, a uni, unified country where every state had separate uh, wishes and clearly they all wanted to create a federal structure in the country, uh, but that was uh, not easy with, um, with 21 armed organization. Next. This was on the Panglong conference. This is the peace uh, conference uh, because in two, uh, 2015, there was um, a national ceasefire agreement, but only 10 out of 21 ethnic armed organizations joined this uh, national ceasefire agreement. So the Panglong conference where, the, uh, where we discussed how to move on in the peace process uh, was regularly uh, held and I was invited in 2018 by Aung An San Suu Kyi to be part of this uh, conference. Here you can see on the left hand side the leader of the KNU um, and uh, clearly I had contact with all uh, ethnic armed organizations. Next. Clearly I had also to, I visited Myanmar, I visited him or his uh, deputy. And uh, the, the discussions were always very open, frank, critical. Um, the, this I could do because of my strategy. I never went in the public to tell what we uh, really discussed. But clearly inside the UN, I informed regularly my boss, Secretary General, and also in close contact with the UNCT, so the, the UN country team. Um, I had always open openness from the, the army and they were quite constructive with me uh, on my recommendations. 
uh, but clearly I had to change also the, the narrative uh, on the Rohingya issue. Uh, it was not easy, but I think it helped that I grew up in Asia. I lived uh, 10 years, the first 10 years of my life in Japan. So when I go to, um, to Asia, I have a, clearly an Asian approach uh, when I talk to the people. Next. Clearly, I also visited every time uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. The first two, uh, the first two, three meetings were with her entourage, but then I realized that they even uh, have mistrust between uh, the people uh, in or the members in the ministries because they were also um, the the former army people worked in the ministries and they didn't have really trust inside the ministry. So I decided to have meetings with her alone. And uh, each time when I traveled to Myanmar, I had um, one or two hours meeting with her. Next. My task was also to inform uh, the Security Council on demand. This was normally three times per year. Since the coup happened on the 1st of February, uh, it was already seven times and maybe there will be a next one in the coming next two weeks. But I also had to um, brief the General As Assembly uh, twice a year um, and especially also on the Rohingya issue. Next. Clearly, on um, if you uh, heard all my tasks, then I had to prioritize a little bit what I can do with only two staff members in the beginning. Now I have five at the end of my mandate, but uh, it was not so uh, easy to, uh, to have a complete um, uh, staff. Um, but when I started, I decided to concentrate on Rakhine, which is the, the state in the West, uh, of Myanmar where the Rohingyas uh, lived uh, or still live, uh, some of them. And um, Aung San Suu Kyi agreed that I uh, concentrate my work on this issue to help to implement the Kofi Annan's uh, recommendations and to make um, the Rakhine conducive for the return of the one million refugees. Here you can see a picture which I took from the helicopter. Um, the army always provided me a, a helicopter and I could really go wherever I wanted uh, to travel in Rakhine. Here you see that was in 2018 when I started my mandate, you see still the burned villages. Um, when I last time I traveled to Rakhine uh, before COVID, uh, it was difficult to see uh, those uh, burned villages again because uh, now the, the nature took over and um, yeah, so, but that's the reason it's important to have the evidences also for the accountability issue. Next. Uh, in Rakhine, I um, talked to the Rohingya people in the IDP camps. We have all over the country, we have 140 IDP camps. Uh, alone in Rakhine, we have 127,000 IDPs um, and they live in camps. And I had to talk with them, what can I do for them, what they uh, want uh, uh, from my mandate to be changed for their uh, situation, especially on the citizenship um, and therefore I traveled uh, around in 24 uh, camps, but I went back all, almost in the same camps to see if my recommendations worked and if the situation changed. Next. This is the zero zone. This is the zone between Bangladesh and Myanmar, uh, where the people cannot move uh, because it's um, a closed zone. Uh, I think only ICRC can provide them with uh, assistance. So I had to talk with the Rohingyas over the fence. Next. Uh, in Rakhine, I clearly also uh, had discussion with the people from the Buddhist community, but also from the Hindu community. 
uh, it was important to have a social cohesion on the ground that they learn to accept and respect each other because the army uh, made this divide for many years. That was a strategy uh, to create a scapegoat uh, that they were the Rohingyas. And uh, therefore, I my task was also to bring the communities together again. Next. But then we had another challenge in January 2019. The um, civil war started in Rakhine between the Arakan army and the military, the Tamado. The Arakan army has not a Muslim background. Uh, uh, they have a Buddhist background and they are fighting for a, um, a certain independence of uh, Rakhine. And they want to uh, leave the Arakan dream. And therefore they started to um, kill a police uh, which were um, um, engaged by the, by the, the military from Napido. And then the army came back to Rakhine to fight against the Arakan army. So from that moment on, I had to travel uh, under protection uh, because it was really um, a civil war. But I was glad that I still could uh, go to Rakhine to talk to the people. And Aung San Suu Kyi agreed that I can send one of my staff member regularly alone to Rakhine to talk to the people and to come back with recommendations uh, to implement them. Next. Here you can see um, Cox Bazar. This is the biggest um, um, refugee camp in the world with 1 million uh, Rohingyas. Um, I visited the camp uh, in the beginning of my mandate, three and a half years ago, uh, and I thought I'd just go there to know the, the, the conditions what, uh, to, that I can talk to the Rohingyas, what they want, um, and that I can concentrate my work on Rakhine. But then I realized that this, the, the bilateral um, relationship is not so good between Myanmar and Bangladesh. Um, and I talked to many people, not only in the camps. Um, next. Uh, so here you see the conditions, how the Rohingya live uh, in, in Cox Bazar. Next. And I talked to the women, especially because that was maybe um, also an advantage to be a, a woman as a special envoy. Um, as a man, you couldn't talk uh, to them alone. Uh, that's um, a Muslim community. Um, and so I could uh, hear really the challenges of the life in, in uh, Cox Bazar uh, camps. Next. So when I went to Dhaka, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and her foreign minister asked me also to um, mediate between the two countries uh, to have a better implementation of the MOU, which was created between Bangladesh and Myanmar for the repatriation of the Rohingyas. I asked my boss, Secretary General, if I should do this as well, additionally to my uh, mandate. And he said, yes, please. So uh, then I have was six times before Corona or COVID-19 um, visited Bangladesh, uh, Dhaka, but also uh, Cox Bazar. Next. Yeah, then we had uh, the civil war uh, started, in my view, uh, again on the 1st of uh, February with the military coup. Uh, this was really um, so uh, sad because um, I am my team and I, we could really improve the situation on the ground and many recommendations were implemented. Uh, even also the, the election 2020 was a, a success. Um, uh, it was a transparent, fair election with a clear victory of the NLD party. So the military coup started on the 1st of February. Uh, I say started because it's not, ended, the, the military has not the upper hand and they couldn't create stability after the 1st of February. Next. 
the, in the beginning, the people demonstrated um, peacefully on the street and the resistance was very um, heavy and is still uh, very strong. So the people created um, a CDM, a civil disobedience movement. Uh, people didn't go back to work, uh, especially not the health worker. So the banking system collapsed, the health system collapsed. Um, and the, the military ha has sti have still difficulty to uh, gain uh, upper hand and to create a stability. Next. But then the military came uh, really quickly with huge violence on the street. And I can tell you, I receive every day very heavy um, um, video clips from the people uh, in Myanmar, which shows the scale of the violence uh, going on in Myanmar. Next. But then the people um, started also to take um, arms and um, they uh, first self-made weapons, but then they were also provided uh, by the ethnic armed organizations um, with weapons because now they have a common enemy is the, the army in Napido. And they also get um, uh, training uh, from the ethnic armed organizations. And therefore we can really see every day uh, heavy clashes between the army and the people. Next. So the situation is very bad now. And as I said, the UN has now to care about 3 million people. And it's very difficult situation because the, the military um, wanted to gain legitimacy uh, as the government, but now it's the credential committee at the UN who has the, the say, who is really the government. For the moment, both sides uh, wanted to be seen as the, the legal government. Uh, therefore, the situation is uh, very um, difficult and very uh, violent. And my, my view in the future, unfortunately, for the moment is very pessimistic. But I hope that my idea of a full, uh, of an all-inclusive dialogue, which was not responded positively by the, um, the army, maybe the special envoy of ASEAN or my successor will have more success to implement because the country needs peace. And if you see this picture, it shows we need to uh, continue to stand for the people because the children should not have um, a lost um, uh, generation and uh, they should finally live in peace uh, in this very beautiful country. So this is a little bit in a nutshell, but uh, I hope to uh, get a lot of questions of which where I can give you more details. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, thank you very much indeed, uh, Special Envoy. Uh, that was a really detailed contextual overview of the situation in Myanmar over the period when you have been Special Envoy um, and uh, some really rich insights in relation to your role and the efforts you have gone to to, to address the situation there. Um, it's, it's particularly interesting to hear about your engagement on the ground with the displaced communities um, with the ethnic groups uh, and also with the army as well, the Tatmadaw, um, and, and watching and seeing the mobilization of people on the streets of Myanmar um, is, 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 is quite extraordinary, but of course, highly regrettable that that has now descended into, uh, into a, a, a violent situation and, and all that comes with that. So, so, so thank you very much indeed um, for um, a really rich presentation. I might just ask you, there are lots of questions in the chat, but I might just ask you a couple of questions before we, we move to the Q&A session. Um, there have been sanctions imposed against Myanmar by the international community. Um, what's your assessment of those sanctions and to what extent could they be, uh, could they be strengthened even further as a means of, of, of confronting and uh, combating the situation there? 
Yeah, sanctions, clearly it's up to the member states of the UN and not uh, on the UN to decide on sanctions. Uh, in my view, sanctions can be effectful if they are targeted, because we should not um, punish uh, once again the population. But if it's targeted against the people who made an unlawful um, military coup, then it can have an effect. And um, therefore, um, I think uh, until now, many countries uh, took sanctions. Uh, the lead had always the US and then um, the EU followed. That's also a reason I traveled several times to Brussels to talk uh, with the EU, uh, but then also um, um, other countries who followed sanction, but um, I, there is clearly still um, space for more sanctions, but as I said, it's up to the, the member states. The most powerful sanctions clearly would uh, come from the Security Council, but I doubt that the Security Council will have a resolution because in the Security Council we have China and Russia who are normally against sanctions. Mm -hmm. And you haven't been to Myanmar since the coup, and nor indeed has the ASEAN Special Envoy been there yet either. Um, to, to what extent do you expect that, you know, given that you have engagement with the army, to what extent is there any prospect of, of that engagement being reinforced? I had always contact with the army also since the coup, like in the in the night of the coup in Switzerland night, it was already early in the morning in Myanmar. Uh, one of my staff um, called me and she said the coup happened. And then I asked to talk immediately with the army so I could talk at three o'clock in the night with the com deputy commander in chief for three hours. And um, afterwards, I had several meetings with him virtually, but uh, clearly the army was not keen to invite me back to Myanmar because uh, I was, I'm was i still very well known in the country. And once uh, there was a rumored special envoys in town and thousands of people went to the airport to greet me. So therefore the army has no interest that the, the people are uh, uh, again encouraged to continue their resistance with my presence on the ground. So my last um, meeting I had was uh, end of July with uh, the deputy commander in chief virtually, uh, but I also met the commander in chief in Jakarta because I went back to the region in April, May, uh, June. Uh, I was based in Bangkok then, and I traveled to Jakarta and Japan. And in Jakarta, I could have a, a long discussion with the commander in chief. And uh, then I um, proposed an all inclusive dialogue where the SAC, which is now the, the, the government of the, the, the army, uh, they would also be included in such a dialogue. Um, the ethnic armed organization agreed to this proposal. I spoke to almost all of them. The, the NUG, which is now the national unity government of the people of the former NLD uh, government, uh, they were also uh, in favor of my support, but clearly they had some conditions like the release of the political prisoners, including Aung San Suu Kyi and the president. Uh, but the army didn't give me uh, any uh, answer back. Um, so the special envoy of ASEAN has also the, uh, the task from the ASEAN to have a dialogue. He traveled in, I think it was in June, before he was appointed special envoy. And now he, he wants to go back to Myanmar as the special envoy, but he couldn't because um, the conditions he made were not fulfilled by the army. Mm -hmm. And just before I move to the Q&A, one, one final question. You've talked a lot about the political process and, and, and the diplomacy around the situation in Myanmar. But isn't it true as well that there is a role for commercial interests, um, like, for example, oil and gas companies, some which are headquartered uh, in the United States, for example, that there's a role for the textile industry. Some of the biggest and most luxurious brands in the world have had large textile uh, 
textile factories in Myanmar, which are now effectively closed down. And a role as well for communication companies, some of the largest communication companies in the world, like, like Facebook, for example, and others, in terms of maintaining open access to communication in Myanmar as well. What, what, what's your view on, on the role, a more, I suppose, a more robust role for some of those interests in, in confronting the situation there? Yeah. Yeah, the, the economy is suffering, really. It's, uh, we, if we see probably next year, the half of the population will uh, live under the poverty line and will also start to um, uh, starving. And uh, this situation is really dire. And um, as you mentioned, the, the companies from outside also suffering because um, People don't go to the work and um, they, they want to have this disobedience uh, continued. Uh, the people also started uh, to attack uh, such constructions like the telecommunication um, antennas and uh, also the pipelines. Um, therefore, the countries uh, involved in this um, business have an interest that uh, the country finds back to a stability. And in the forefront is clearly China, who has also the interest to implement their Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so therefore, I hope also uh, that the, such countries will uh, help to uh, get stability in the country, but to respect the wish of the people. Because if I get... Um, messages every day from the people on the ground, then it's the more or less uh, they would rather like to die than to go back in a military dictatorship. That's uh, very sad, but that's, uh, I think, not a no turning point because it's not the same situation as we had in the past, like in 1988, because people lived now in the last 10 years, more or less under a certain freedom, and they could see how the, look, the world looks like over the border, and they have social media. They are very well connected, which they were not uh, in 1988. So people don't want, uh, they want to stop, stop the cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been very clear since February, the resilience of, of the Myanmar people and their, their intent that, that this situation will be, will be reversed. Let me just go to some questions now from, from the Q&A. We have a question, excuse my pronunciation here, a question from Nien Nien Pai. And uh, the question is, if the international community's current diplomatic approach fails to prevent the worsening situation in Myanmar, what is the likelihood that the international community will take action and intervene in the near future? So I suppose, what, what do you think the prospects are for, for resolution as if the situation deteriorates? Yeah, I always in my statements in the Security Council or in the GA uh, made an appeal um, to the international community make action to really revert the situation. Um, if this, if that doesn't happen, then um, it's it's really difficult for the people on the ground. So uh, I still hope uh, that. Um, we have um, good decisions from the Security Council or from also from the ASEAN to help the situation uh, change and uh, also uh, from big players like China, Russia and the US. Um, but uh, clearly we, we have to stand with the people and also Secretary General Guterres condemned very heavily the, the coup happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A uh, question also from Niall O'Keefe from Trokra here in Ireland, an NGO. And the question is, what can Ireland do to ensure Myanmar, and in particular the humanitarian situation, is raised more urgently in the UN Security Council? Yeah, the humanitarian situation is really bad and uh, clearly the COVID uh, pandemic is still going on and it's completely out of control. So the, the UN together with donors uh, want to bring uh, vaccination um, to, to Myanmar, but this is not easy because um, the, the providers of the vaccine also um, asking a certain um, 
contract with the government, but who is the government? And uh, we should avoid to give legitimacy to the military junta. Therefore, uh, and on the same time, we need access through the army, because if not, we cannot reach the people. And this is now a very delicate balancing act, um, how we can bring the vaccine to the, to the people without uh, also neglecting their, their uh, uh, voice and, and uh, choice that they don't want to get the vaccine by the military junta. And this is an ongoing discussion which we have, and that's also a reason why I travel next week to New York to discuss this inside the UN. I was uh, two, three weeks ago also in Geneva to meet the Global Fund and COAX uh, to discuss this. And I mean, almost every second day in contact with the UNCT on the ground uh, on this issue. So this is an ongoing uh, uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. And in terms of Ireland's role specifically now with a seat on the UN Security Council, um, what, what sort of advice would you have for Ireland in terms of uh, bringing these issues onto the agenda more robustly? Yeah, Ireland is really active in the Security Council, and I really appreciated always the discussion with your uh, PR, uh, Geraldine, and um, I think the E10, the non-permanent members, they can really do a lot um, and they can also uh, be a bridge between the, the strong ones who don't want to have any action um, and to, that they can discuss with them to bring action from the Security Council. And uh, I know Ireland is also very strong on the issue of um, uh, WPS, so Women, Peace and Security. And uh, the women also play a very important role in Myanmar. So uh, Ireland is a, a, a very uh, good support in the Security Council. Uh, a question from Alex White, who's chair of the IIEA's energy group. Uh, thanking you for your excellent and informative presentation and asking about your sense of how or whether the legal system is functioning under the current coup regime. Uh, has that also collapsed? And he is particularly interested in whether you think there is any functioning system for the resolution of labor disputes, uh, which, which did exist prior to the coup. Yeah, that's very difficult because um, now we have so many uh, political prisoners, 82% uh, of them, we don't know where they are exactly. So they don't have any protection. So the legal system, in my view, doesn't work. And uh, we have a chaotic system. Um, there, there are some trials uh, like uh, against Aung San Suu Kyi and the president. Uh, but we just heard today that um, the, the lawyer of Aung San Suu Kyi was now um, uh, forbidden by the, the Kunta to have contact with the outside world. So um, I cannot contact him anymore uh, without harming him. So this is a very bad situation. And I don't know exactly what uh, means it for other people uh, who want to have justice, but honestly, also before the coup, it was difficult. Remember the Reuters uh, journalists um, who were sentenced. Um, so the army had in fact always the upper hand, even before the coup. And this is uh, sometimes forgotten because uh, the army created in 2008 their own constitution, uh, which says, that the, the army has 25% of the, the seats in the parliament. Um, if they want to change uh, the constitution, then the constitution says in another article, it needs more than 75% of the votes in the parliament. So the army had always like a veto right. And that was the reason that Aung San Suu Kyi could never change really uh, um, the constitution or laws uh, because she was always uh, clear that she wanted to change the system 
to have a real democracy in the country. So the army had always the power and that was also the root causes of the coup. They, they didn't want to accept that Aung San Suu Kyi was really determined now to change the constitution. A question from David Joyce, who's the equality officer with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And uh, David, thanks you for your great insight into your work. Uh, he says the trade union movement has been calling for a number of actions, including recognition of the CRPH and the National Unity Government at the UN General Assembly, establish formal contacts and channeling of humanitarian aid with and through the National Unity Government, and moving from sanctions and restrictive measures on individuals to the State Administration Council as an entity to sanction, especially in the oil and gas um, and the timber sector and all international financial flows via European companies. The European Parliament's resolution adopted on the 7th of October shows support for such measures. And the question is, do you agree that in order for real change to happen, global capital must start to feel the pressure because it's not okay for business to funnel resources to the military and it's not okay for banks and others to invest in these companies and that uh, action is needed if we're going to save lives and, and restore democracy. I agree that action is needed. That was also always uh, the voice of the Secretary General, but how and what, it's clearly up to the member states. Um, from the UN, we cannot do any recommendations, mm -hmm. but uh, you, I can assure you that I'm in contact with so many governments and, um, like I, when I heard that the, the Senate of France uh, just now accepted the NUG as the legal government, uh, maybe others will follow. But at the UN, uh, it's the Credential Committee, which is composed by nine member states. And in the, those nine, we have three permanent members, this uh, US, Russia, and China. And they had, uh, they came together, but they didn't make make an, any uh, decision uh, yet, but they decided uh, to, to postpone the decision. And until then, the, the Myanmar uh, appointment uh, ambassador in Tun, and, uh, and then there could be that the credential committee makes another um, decision in the maybe in November. So it's up to them, but member states can do uh, if they think uh, it's enough and they should have action. It's up to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Feroza Dada. And by way of background here, uh, Feroza's wife is a Pandai from Shan State and they have set up a UK charity some years ago to help the Pau children at Inla Lake. Uh, this is a very practical question because given the political situation, they are unable to send money through to the bank to help those people. Have you any suggestions as to how assistance can be sent to Myanmar at the moment? Yeah, I know there are some channels, uh, but maybe not here in public. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, she can write to me, we, I can connect her. <laughs> okay, perhaps we can facilitate a connection after today's event. And um, mm -hmm. thank you, Special Envoy. Uh, we have another question from Niall O'Keefe from Trokara, who's asking, how do we facilitate Myanmar civil society to speak at the international level? What risk mitigation measures can the international community provide? Yeah, I think the international community should continue to be loud. Uh, otherwise, this conflict will be forgotten because uh, we know sometimes it will get normal for the international community. But I think we are in a very critical period because the, the stability was not gained by the, the, uh, the army and therefore we can revert the situation. So the international com community should stay, uh, be loud and to give support to the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does strike me that from the outside that 
what's uh, very much valued by people on the ground and particularly the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar is that people uh, stay attuned to what's happening in Myanmar and that it remains on the international agenda. And, uh, and I think that's a, a very important message which, which civil society in Myanmar has been, has been seeking to, uh, to spread. Um, another question from Niall O'Keefe as well about the EU and what the European Union can do to increase pressure on, on, on the military to return Myanmar to democracy? Well, the EU always uh, also followed the sanctions from the US and they just made a, a, a resolution. Um, yeah, I, as, I think it's the same. They, it's up to them uh, if they want to do more. Um, clearly, um, we should be careful not to, to harm the people again. And as I always said, uh, violence is never um, a solution, but um, I also can not really say to the people, yeah, just accept the situation how it is. So we have to understand that the people are very angry and uh, are frustrated. So I hope still that we find a peaceful solution through dialogue, but for the moment, it seems very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, Seamus Allen, who's a researcher at the IIEA asks, what steps could Myanmar realist realistically take to ensure successful integration with equality and inclusion for the ethnic minorities alongside uh, the Bamar majority? Yeah, um, maybe that's the only positive thing of the coup that the, the Bama majority with a Buddhist background had never faced the violence from the army, from Tamado. But now uh, the Tamado is attacking them as well in the same uh, manner. The, 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 the forecut uh, strategy is the same. They burning villages uh, now in Sagain and in uh, Kaya, Kain, um, in Chin. So it's not anymore in the, um, in the region, uh, formerly in Kachin or Shan. Um, and that brought the people now together. Um, many Bama people are sending me messages that they said, we were not aware how much the ethnic minority suffered in the past and the, how much the, the scale uh, of the violence was. And also on the Rohingya issue, they, they said, oh, we, we are sh ashamed that we didn't help them in the past. And we, we are really sorry what happened to the Rohingyas. And this is new. And therefore the, the unity of the people is higher than ever. And that could be, a chance for the country. And if, if we have a stability once in the country, I really hope and I'm sure that if the right people are in the government, then they will also protect the ethnic minorities in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, that, is, that is one positive to, to cling to. Uh, we have a question from Quiva de Barra, who's the CEO of Trocra here in Ireland. And it's a question about women, peace and security. And she asks, would it be useful for Ireland to hold a discussion on women, peace, security and Myanmar at the informal expert group on women, peace and security at the UN and the Security Council? So I suppose in terms of Ireland actually leading on an issue. Yeah, I um, was uh, briefing this group in New York several times. And um, I think it's always uh, important to talk about the situation of the women uh, because normally they, they are really the, under the vulnerable group, but also they are very strong and they are strong in, in resisting uh, the, the military coup. And um, I spoke yesterday three hours nonstop with uh, women in Rakhine. So I'm, I'm still in contact with the women on the ground and they really appreciate uh, the discussions um, that they are not thinking that we uh, uh, forgot them and that we uh, lost them. So um, it's always good to discuss uh, the situation of the women uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that has been a, a priority issue for Ireland uh, through its membership of the Security Council. So um, a question from Sobu. 
Uh, how can the UN help vaccination programs in Myanmar? And in particular, what's your position on COVAX delivery? Yeah, we work uh, the uh, UNICEF and WHO, but also my team is um, uh, present at such meetings on, on uh, COVID prevention and protection measures. And we hope that we can bring the vaccine um, through Global Fund and Co uh, COVAX uh, to the country, but clearly uh, without legitimation, uh, the SAC, and that's important. So we hope that the discussion will be fruitful, that we can help the people on the ground in the respect of the wish of the people. Mm -hmm. And a question from a master's student, uh, Nia O'Sullivan at University College Cork. And she talks about the shrinking of the humanitarian space since the coup having been alarming and uh, asks about your insights uh, from your dialogue with the Tatmadaw on, uh, I suppose, their willingness to facilitate and allow humanitarian assistance and to allow humanitarian organizations to carry out their activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Tatmado, they want to have the, the lead on humanitarian assistance, and that's not what the people want. So we have to continue to, to discuss with them to find a solution which is acceptable. So clearly we will um, be very careful, and uh, this is also a discussion which I will follow next week in New York. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we're, we're close to the end of, of this afternoon's session and uh, Special Envoy, we're very grateful for your, uh, for your frankness and, and, and for your insights um, and for your advice as well. Could I maybe conclude by asking you, um, you've mentioned that you're pessimistic uh, about the prospects for the future. Could you talk us through that a little bit more um, uh, in terms of how you see the situation transpiring over the next few months? and what efforts could be made here in Ireland uh, at the Security Council or by the international community to, to avert the worst, the worst of those crises that, that may be to come? Yeah. yeah, if both sides don't want to give up uh, and use more and more violence, then clearly we will have a, a scale of a full-blown um, um, internal armed conflict. And uh, this to, to solve and to change will be more and more difficult. So therefore, I still hope that the ASEAN Special Envoy will be allowed under his conditions uh, to travel to Myanmar and to uh, reason the, the Tamado uh, to, to discuss and uh, also to release uh, the political prisoners. Otherwise, I think it's up to the Security Council to take action. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's really been, um, it's been a, a fascinating discussion and uh, we're very grateful for your time um, and, uh, and for your insights in relation to the current situation in Myanmar. And you'll see from the number of questions coming from the audience, there is a very healthy appetite and, and interest in the situation in Myanmar. And, an eagerness uh, for Ireland to, to play a role, whether it's humanitarian organizations, uh, the Irish parliament or, or, or the Irish government itself through the Security Council. So I know that you have just two weeks left in your role as special envoy. So can I take the opportunity to thank you for your service as special envoy and uh, to wish you the very best uh, for the next stage of, of your career. And uh, I think it's safe to say that here in Ireland, we'll be watching Myanmar with interest uh, for some years to come and, and hoping that the situation there stabilizes and improves. But thank for you. now, special envoy, uh, sincere thank you. Uh, thank you to the IIEA for hosting today's session, to the Department of Foreign Affairs for sponsoring, sponsoring the Global Europe Programme, and to all of you who joined us online for today's uh, webinar. I hope you found it interesting and valuable, and thanks for your participation. Thank you very much. Have a lovely weekend. And I wish Mia more peace, and thank you, uh, Ireland, for your continued support. It's great. Thank you.